1956, there was a world symposium of the practical use of solar energy held in Phoenix, Arizona, and it was reported in the April edition of Popular Mechanics again in 1956. And what they featured were a whole load of solar thermal devices. Things like solar cookers, solar ovens, solar distillation. A solar distillation was by Maria Telkus and it was produced in the ward for the emergency desalination of seawater for downed pilots. And she's reported to have saved many, many lives. She's also credited with the creation of the first solar thermal system using a phase change material, which was uh, Glauber's salt, as it happens. Glauber's salt is just sodium sulfate and it has a quite interesting property. When you add water to it, it gets hot, actually it gets very hot. Of course what you're left with is a load of wet salt that you then need to dry and as you dry it, it gets cold. What Maria did was use this in her solar thermal house. She dipped water onto buckets of Glauber's salt and then when they were wet she dried them out again using solar thermal and so you had a complete cycle of a central heating system. Now, lots of materials will do this, and this adding of water to generate heat is actually relatively common, and we've used them before. Zeolite occurs naturally, but they also make different forms of zeolite, and those zeolites are, are named with numbers. This particular one is uh, X13. It's used, I think, for cleaning ammonia out of fish ponds or something like that, but it does have a stunning and amazing property and I'm going to give you a close-up so that you can see it in action because it truly is amazing. Okay so I've filled my stainless steel ashtray with a bit of the zeolite and watch what happens when I pour on water. It boils almost immediately. That is awesome. Pour on some more water and add our Stirling engine. <laughs> and there she goes. Look at that bad boy run. What it is, is that when they're separate like this, they have a higher energy. When you combine them, the energy is much lower, and so that extra energy is given out as heat. As I say, when you're dissolving things, actually, that happens, you just don't notice it. But when we add this to this, which doesn't dissolve it, the water goes into the galleries of the clay, that extra energy is super, super noticeable. Of course, the immediate question is, can we do something with that? And I was thinking about it because there are some awesome things you can do with it. One of the things you can do with it is you can take this as a Peltier device. Find these in beer chillers, that sort of thing. And it's really good for when you have a heat difference that is cold on one side and hot on the other side, it will generate an electric current between these two wires. So if we can get something hot and something cold, we can automatically generate electricity from it. So I've got one here. And I've got a little steel tin. Now this steel tins are battered about and it's quite dented, so a thermal paste would work really well. I'm going to use a bit of graphite foil as a thermal contact. So put the foil on there, put that on there, and we have a thermal contact. Now I'm going to add my dry clay into my steel tin. There we go. And we're going to add some water to that. So this is just clay and water. So we add some water to it, it's going to get hot. You see it boiling the water immediately. I'm going to put that on. Give it a bit of pressure so we get a good contact between the cold marble under here and the hot tin can. What I want you to do is keep your eye on that motor there. There we go. <laughs> now, what we've got here is a Stirling engine. It's just one bought from Amazon. It's a cheap Chinese thing. And it does, in fact, run from the heat of a coffee cup. What I want to do, really, of course, is run it from caustic soda. So we've got a soda Stirling engine. Now, to do that, what I need to do is turn it upside down. It makes no difference whether it's that way up or that way up. And to hold it upside down, I've got a little cradle. And if I pop that into my little cradle,
There we go, we can put a beaker on the top and now all we need to do is heat that beaker. So that will become the hot end and that will become the cold end and to heat that beaker we're going to use this stuff which is sodium hydroxide. Hence the gloves incidentally. So we pop that sodium hydroxide in there. And now all we have to do is add some water. We've got some water, we can chuck it in there. And what will happen, obviously, is the sodium hydroxide will begin to dissolve. And as it does so, it'll get hot. I mean, it gets really hot, actually. It'll get hot as boiling. And I don't know if you can see that the steam is actually already beginning to rise on that. And that should create a hot end, cold end for our sterling so that we can get the sterling running. And there it is. My soda-driven Stirling engine working away. But that quick lime is a commodity chemical on itself. You can buy bags of it if you want, or you can buy chalk or limestone and cook it. Either way, it's a ton of this stuff around, and it is a huge, very cheap commodity chemical that's produced in the millions of tons and has been since prehistory. This has been uh, known about for at least the last three, four thousand years, at least. Now, I'm interested in it because of that really strong reaction that we just saw. It is astonishingly exothermic. The reaction itself can get up to about 300 degrees centigrade, no problem at all. So we put a little bit of our quick lime into this here, and then add a few drops of water to it, and it will begin to get extraordinarily hot and that will come off as a steam. You can already see a lot of steam being generated there. And if you're doing a large amount of this, you have to be careful with uh, a wood surround because it will burn the wood, it gets that hot. So it gets incredibly hot. Because what we've got here is a Stirling engine and a Stirling engine is a heat difference engine. So we give that a few minutes to cook and if the thing gets uh, too cold, add a few more drops of water, then we can watch that Stirling engine run. The joy of this is that you're just adding water. So if you want to recharge it, all you have to do is dry it. Things like sodium hydroxide and zeolite will just dry in the sun, so you're effectively creating a solar heat battery that can directly generate electricity from something like a Peltier device. And of course, there's no moving parts, so there's absolutely nothing to wear out, which is super cool. Now, you have to create that heat difference. You can have one side hot and the other side in the air, which is your ambient, and you'll get a heat difference equally. You can do exactly the same if you make one side cold. Now on this one we're going to put this heat sink back on. This heat sink was part of the um, original fridge. There we go. Part of the original fridge. And it helped with the distribution of heat. So we're just going to pop it back on just to hold it in place, put a screw back in. And that will capture the heat of the surrounding area so we've got the ambient heat and what we need to do is make it cold now when a reaction is hot and it gives out heat it's called exothermic now the opposite of that is endothermic an endothermic reaction will take heat from the environment to run its reaction and it will get cold and a really cool one is this stuff this is urea. It's the principal component of urine. Now, urea, when you add water to it, gets cold. So if I take my Peltier device with its heat sink on for the atmosphere, stick it in there and dissolve it, it's going to get cold. It actually gets very cold. And once that starts to get cold, what we get is the surrounding atmosphere at one temperature, this at a very much reduced temperature, and so we get the heat gradient that we want. And we'll get enough of a heat gradient to run this motor, which I think is just crackers. And there it is spinning away, 
from the cold side because we've got the colder side that way and this is an ambient so it's being warmed by the air around it and like I say Peltier's work from temperature difference so this is an endothermic reaction and of course a lots of endothermic reactions you're thinking about those instant cold packs for instance would do exactly the same and to restore this dry it in the sun. So you should be getting the idea that there are lots of materials that will do this and lots of ways of actually using it directly produce electricity, move a motor, run air conditioning, run trains, just a whole range of applications that these materials have. But of course each material comes with its own issues and its own workarounds and how to get the best out of it. And unfortunately, Maria Telkus's salt eventually started to rot the containers it was in, and so it was abandoned. However, there is a new kid on the block, and this has been called the Eindhoven heat battery. What the team at Eindhoven Technical University did was literally study hundreds of materials before they settled on potassium carbonate, because that can withstand the cycling and is readily available. First they mixed it with a carbon, and probably graphite, to improve heat transfer. And then they separated it into cells, creating a module, and stacked the modules up. Because it's inefficient to discharge the whole thing, you discharge it in parts. And a stack of modules can store something like 200 kilowatt hours of energy. The benefit here is it's completely lossless. If you seal those dry cells, nothing happens. They don't lose any of their energy. Once they've been wet and carted off, again, nothing happens. They've given up all their energy. And the plan is to take it to an industrial unit where there's waste heat, because anything below 150 degrees centigrade is of no use to industry, and that's an awful lot of energy. It's petajoules that is just being chucked away. So you take it to a deposit where it can be dried, and then take them back to a house. Now, they are driving things around, but they aren't having to lay pipelines to carry gas or hot water, which are the other plans associated with this. It's taken something like 12 years to get the whole system right, including improving the materials, the heat exchanger, the control system. But they are way beyond a simple prototype, and the battery stack they have now has been considered a demonstrator as opposed to a prototype, and they've installed it in four houses to test how this idea will work in real life. The units are 70 kilowatt hours each, and that's enough to last for quite a few days without sun or wind. And they've installed them uh, two in Netherlands, one in Poland and one in France. They've been awarded a seven-figure European development grant with lots of additional funding, and that's mostly because they expect to take three and a half million homes off of gas and provide the heating with the heat battery. And that's more than twice what the Netherlands government were looking for in their climate change commitment programme. Now it's been called a game changer, and if you think about it, it's a simple device with a long history, some careful research, and probably, most important of all, some serious backing. So it's quite likely that in the Netherlands, at least, this will be a game changer. It's also reasonably likely that if it does what it says, we're all going to be heating our houses with salt in a tin. Anyway, I hope you enjoyed the video. Thank you very much for watching, and please do remember to like and subscribe.